if and when, and I think it's when, uh, a Labour government is elected in the coming general election, an immediate priority will be to open a pretty deep and widespread discussion with the European Union, not only about this issue that we're discussing, but about a panoply of other issues, some of them legacy issues, immediately legacy issues from Brexit, others new issues. Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust, and I'll be talking to a member of our council, John Palmer, today. John is a former European editor of The Guardian and a former board member uh, of the EPC think tank in um, in uh, in Brussels. We'll be talking about the strategic and defence implications uh, for Europe of of two things that are going on at the same at the same time. One of which has already happened: at Ukraine. And the other is the possibility of a Trump presidency. John, in the autumn of last year, there was a, a clear wave of shock that went through European capitals at the prospect of uh, Donald Trump being re-elected. Uh, is that um, shock now being dealt with in a constructive way, or are people still paralysed by the fear and simply fretting about it and hoping it won't happen? Well, I think they are still working through the shock effect of a polling evidence that seems to indicate the likelihood of a Trump presidency later this year. Uh, the implications of it uh, are still being uh, examined in detail. And that's difficult because uh, Mr. Trump is not known for spelling out in precise detail what his general uh, principles and objectives are. But we do know uh, that he regards with great suspicion uh, the role that the Europeans have played in the broader Atlantic uh, security and defense framework, NATO. He's spoken about drastically reducing uh, American backing for NATO. He's even spoken about the probability that NATO will be redundant and uh, uh, of no further great use to the United States. Nobody knows in that spectrum of objectives precisely where the needle uh, to policy will, will fit. Uh, but I think we can say that the EU is moving beyond uh, the initial shock and people asking each other, well, what on earth does this mean? They are, for example, recognizing that uh, the war in Ukraine and the way it is developing, which is not uh, uh, overwhelmingly optimistic from the Ukrainian point of view, and the possibility of a Trump presidency uh, will demand that the European Union spends far more attention to and money on uh, a common uh, defence structure and policy. Uh, and France and Germany have already uh, made uh, specific numbered commitments uh, to contribute to what would be the doubling of EU member states' investment in defence in the period between now and uh, 2026. Will that um, be soon enough for any uh, any Trump presidency, which might pull the rug out from under the under its support for Ukraine? Uh, well, I think the the level of support for Ukraine is already being stepped up. These longer term defence uh, proposed defence policy expenditure increases are to uh, secure a more medium term support for um, not only for Ukraine, primarily for Ukraine, but more generally to equip the Union with the means of having some delivery of its broader foreign and security policy. Uh, and that broader economic and uh, security policy framework is going to be very actively debated in the context of the proposed European foreign and policy and security policy uh, uh, debate on integration, collective decision making. Uh, there is even talk that uh, the United Kingdom, while still, of course, outside the European Union, uh, uh, that the uh, present government and certainly the probable incoming Labour government would be interested to actively participate in those discussions. So the, the shock on, on Trump has moved from 
what on earth does this mean? He talks about the end of NATO and America, America pulling out. Now preparing the ground for some uh, resolution of the conundrum that that would place European if it really happened without them preparing an insurance policy. But you talked about collective decision making within the European Union. We'll talk about the United Kingdom in a minute. Um, but in foreign and security policy, it's always been impossible up till now to agree between the member states uh, a process for collective decision making because defence and uh, security policy is so much to preserve not of national sovereignty, but of national governments, of national executives. Um, do you think that really can change over the next five years? I, I think it is beginning to change, Brendan. Yes, I do. And you can see that in terms of the way that France and Germany, as always the uh, the vanguard countries in the process of closer European cooperation and, and potentially integration, have committed hard and fast numbers, and they are very, very substantial numbers, to their contribution to a much strengthened European um, defence strategy and, and security strategy. Yes, there will be questions uh, in at least some member states about whether this is a good idea or not. It's not likely the figures on defence spending will be national government decisions. We now know from the two biggest ones, France and Germany, what those numbers that they've committed to are, and they go forward for a number of years. And that is uh, echoed very much by the Baltic countries, by many of the other uh, uh, European member states. Some uh, uh, are not indicated what, if anything, it will mean to them. But I think the direction of travel is a bit clearer than it was a few months ago. You talked about France and Germany. Until recently, there have been a number of commentators saying that France and Germany seem to be pointing in opposite directions. And there was um, ill-concealed criticism of, uh, of Macron and what he had to say about, um, about uh, French soldiers being in Ukraine um, from the German side. Uh, there's been a triangular meeting just before the weekend, um, Poland, um, France and Germany. Um, what, how do you assess the outcome of that? Uh, there have been differing, uh, differing analyses. Well, I think it broadly reflects the fact that no doubt in some cases with regret and concern and apprehension that these countries and others in the EU, in the European Union, believe there is now something inevitable about this development that is required of them. It's not what they would have chosen. It's not what they would have preferred. It's not what they had perhaps initially planned for, nor do we yet have the specific and concrete uh, details that show that it's uh, happening on the ground. But I think we are at that stage now that is beyond throwing hands in the air and saying, what on earth are we going to do about a Trump presidency? Some of that still remains because there is genuine ignorance about what the incoming administration's detailed policies will be. We, uh, we believe, or they believe, that at the very least, the US will cut back on its financial support for NATO. Uh, they are not so sure whether the, that Trump will go so far initially as to leave NATO or merely to downgrade his membership in some way or other. That is, I think, they have no idea. It depends on what the president, what the incoming probable president will do. And that still is a bit of a mystery. Even if there were some more consensual mechanism for arriving at a definition of strategic auto autonomy, um, as Macron um, envisages it, what, what would this strategic auto autonomy be? Would it be possible, really, for the European Union to agree on a vision of strategic autonomy when you have Poland at one end of the spectrum and Hungary at the other? Uh, there are those difficulties. You're quite right. The, particularly, you mentioned Hungary. That is still very much an unresolved issue. Uh, an echo of that can be found in Slovakia uh, as well. Uh, 
Uh, and there are other countries, Ireland, for example, uh, would need, need language that uh, allows them to make some contribution, but without foregoing their independent, particularly independent line on uh, uh, foreign military alliances. So all of those issues remain, but I think the mainstream of the member states are moving uh, in the direction or are preparing to move in some cases or are talking about moving in the direction that the French and Germans are talking about. Uh, Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, the uh, Baltic states, uh, uh, Italy, interestingly, um, and perhaps a bit surprisingly given uh, the nature of the present political leadership, but that in a sense, is uh, an indicator that uh, what um, President uh, Mr. Putin has done is uh, is change the terrain and change the climate in a way that few of us would have predicted. When people talk about common European defence and European defence policy, um, they often talk about uh, common procurement policies and more integrated procurement policies. Um, the European Union and the Commission uh, have some proposals on the table which are about to be discussed. Um, they're, they're, they're pretty small beer given the, the enormous um, reach of the, the armaments industries within the European Union. Um, and that's presumably because uh, in many countries, uh, Defence procurement is an element of uh, uh, of national um, industrial policy. Um, how do you see that set of hurdles as being overcome? Well, Brendan, you, you know as I do that these debates uh, on substantial new commitments go through stages of evolution and development. At first, uh, the language about uh, a common policy translates in terms of closer cooperation on decisions coordinated among national governments. Uh, when it comes to defence and the big security, really big security issues that are now on the agenda, I think we'll go through a protracted phase, which is of intergovernmental coordination uh, and, uh, and, uh, and cooperation. It's interestingly that Brexit Britain outside has said, oh, we're, we're in for that. We're... we're, we're uh, anxious to cooperate, no details yet, no specifics, but the language is not one of, oh no, we're, we're now an independent country, so we don't get involved in these things. Um, and this applies to the opposition Labour Party as well. So for better or for worse, a consensus is emerging. I won't say has emerged, that uh, this is the direction of travel that the European Union needs to take. Remember the former governor of the Bank of England, Robin Lee Pemberton, used to say that any fool can predict the future. The trouble is knowing how long it's going to take to arrive. And this may be a, a, a case of that. Um, you mentioned uh, the British position on all this. Uh, can you tease it out a bit more? Uh, is the position of the present government the same as that of the, the probably incoming Labour government? My impression is that uh, for the incoming Labour government, at least rhetorically, the question of European defence and cooperating on European defence plays a, a slightly more significant role in their thinking or a different role in their thinking from that it plays in present governments. Yes, uh, it's, it's a tricky one, that because I think the present government language is cooperative. Yes, we recognize this is a common security threat that we face, a very serious uh, challenge to uh, the independence of a European country, um, a neighbor, and so on. And yes, the present government is indicating it wants to be involved and it wants to be consulted, and so on. What the format for such uh, a development uh, proves to be, I think, is yet to, to be worked out. The Labour Party shares that position uh, and uh, commitments to increase military spending, defence spending, uh, are already under the belt of uh, the uh, present shadow cabinet and, and Keir Starmer. Uh, so, and it fits with something else that... Um, uh, I think is going to emerge more clearly that uh, if and when, and I think it's when, uh, a Labour government is elected in the coming general election, 
an immediate priority will be to open a pretty deep and widespread discussion with the European Union, not only about this issue that we're discussing, but about a panoply of other issues, some of them legacy issues, immediately legacy issues from Brexit, others new issues where our uh, mutual interest seems to indicate uh, the need for closer cooperation. Uh, and I think there's a third element of beginning to look. This is my opinion of where Labour is heading, uh, to look at some of the undoing of Brexit, uh, of reversing at any rate, some key aspects of Brexit, but that that has yet to be spelt out in greater detail. Coming at the same time as this discussion we are having on foreign and security policy, it certainly uh, reinforces the trend of thinking in the shadow cabinet that we have got to get a much closer understanding with our European Union neighbours and friends, and there are some big issues that need to be confronted early on in in the new government's timetable. I have the impression from some of the things which, to be fair, have been said by Labour-leaning com uh, commentators rather than than uh, Labour leaders themselves, um, that there may be exaggerated hopes placed on the uh, leverage that the British government will be able to generate uh, for the rest of its relations with the European Union through its defence contribution. Um, Lamy has spoken, I think, quite quite interestingly about the possibility of some sort of security pact, a more formal structure than the Conservative Party uh, government envisages. Um, but I'm wondering whether that may not be um, a, a replication of the grave mistake that Theresa May made uh, of believing that it's possible to sidle back into the European Union or to the benefits of the European Union uh, without a, a, a formal commitment to their institutions. Now, do, do you think that that, um, that delusion is still prevalent or at least existent within the Labour Party? I think it's a slightly different uh, scenario, Brendan. I think the Labour Party uh, recognises it can undo some aspects of Brexit, uh, which will involve commitments by the British on the maintenance of standards, for example, relevant to the customs union uh, 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 and, uh, and the whole trading relationship. I think it's, I don't think it will be, they're not going to go in with demands. They're not going to go in with um, rhetorically exaggerated objectives, but the direction of travel to a much closer understanding and in the view of um, what I'm hearing from people in and around the Labour Party uh, is one which would open the way to undoing some of the aspects of Brexit in the short to medium term. And this altogether is now put in a wider context of the security and defence issues where Britain will be a contributor and not a demander, uh, 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 I believe. So uh, uh, I'm not uh, saying it's all going to be uh, plain sailing, far from it. But I think that this crisis in Ukraine and the broader and ominous issues that it raises uh, for East-West relations uh, will reinforce uh, in the in with within the incoming government, the belief that our future lies in a much closer relationship with the European Union, of what precise detail and over what precise timetable to be decided. Under pressure from, uh, as it seems to me, uh, from uh, his members and from his supporters in the Liberal Democrats, Ed Davey has um, hardened the, Lab the Liberal Democrat position um, on terms for reassociation with Europe, to saying it's a goal of the Liberal Democrats to rejoin the single market. Um, can you foresee the, the Labour Party in the next um, term of government, up to 2029 or whenever it is, can you foresee them arriving at that position of bit, uh, making a commitment to rejoin the single market? If such a thing were possible, by the way, I'm not sure if it is, but but let's take that as a, as a rhetorical goal. Do you think that can happen? 
I do, and I think that it may happen in stages and it may happen uh, uh, over that period of time. It won't be one instant package with a ribbon tied and everything is uh, back to the status quo ante. It won't be that. But I think there is every recognition that I can see that uh, the, uh, the Brexit venture of uh, a return of being uh, the global trading power striding the oceans for prosperity, that is now just so dépassé, so uh, out of touch with reality, um, even among conservatives, that I think the Labour government uh, will, uh, they won't do anything dramatic in the short term, it'll be exploratory, but I think Brussels and the Union will clearly get the message that they want to be cooperative, they want to be supportive, they want to be committed where there are collective uh, common issues. Uh, and I think that will change pretty quickly, not immediately, the, the sort of mood uh, in which the media and public opinion in Britain talks about these things. It won't reverse everything immediately, but it will change the direction of travel. Can I enter a caveat there? I think that for most people in Brussels, particularly Brussels, but also in, in the national capitals as well, uh, the question of, of whether the United Kingdom is prepared to be part of and bound by the institutions of the European Union is an absolutely central one. Um, lacking such a commitment, there are no doubt improvements that can be made at the edges to the relationship with the, Euro with the United Kingdom. Um, but but it's only when there is a commitment to accept the institutions, which is what being in the internal market is, is about, um, that any sea change can come about. I'm not sure that everyone in the Labour Party appreciates that yet. Uh, maybe, but I think well, the mood of the membership of the Labour Party is quite strongly to move in the, in the European direction. I can tell you that. The shadow cabinet is not willing to mirror that at the moment because uh, of electoral. They, they 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 want to get back those red wall seats and all the rest of it. But the membership is overwhelmingly much more positive and wants much more uh, uh, positive responses from the shadow cabinet than have yet they have thought politic to agree to. I think around the, quite apart from the issue we've been discussing on foreign and security defense policy, I think the customs union uh, single market area, particularly post the Northern Ireland internal settlement, which points in the direction of concessions that will bring GB more into line with NI, meaning the relationship that Northern Ireland has with the European Union, I think that shows every sign of being again the direction of travel fairly early on in a in a in a in, in a Labour government. Thank you very much. Well, as always, those who live longest will know most. Um, very interesting conversation, and I hope our, our viewers and listeners have enjoyed it. And there are many similar conversations on our website. Thank you very much. Thank you.